Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world. Welcome back to The Caring Economy with me, Toby Usnick. Today, I'm very excited to have as our guest, Fabio Bertoni. He is the general counsel for The New Yorker magazine, a magazine I have subscribed to my whole adult life, and I hope you do too. And he's joining us today to share insights from his illustrious career on navigating the intersection of law, media, and ethics. We'll also touch on AI as well. With an impressive background spanning from HarperCollins Publishers to ALM Media, Fabio brings a wealth of experience to our conversation. I also want to dedicate this session today to my colleague, my friend, actually, Michael Rauschenberg, who passed last year. He was a lifelong subscriber to The New Yorker, and he always clipped the cartoons, and he would always bring them with a bottle of wine or a gift with a little note scribbled on it, because the New Yorker cartoons just are so idiosyncratic, special, and relevant. So this is a shout out to my friend who passed last year, Michael Rauschenberg. Now, with that opening, Fabio, welcome to The Caring Economy. Thanks, Toby. It's great to be here. As I said, I've been a lifelong subscriber. I think that The New Yorker is required reading for New Yorkers, but also I know that the diaspora of New York alumni or New Yorker wannabes across the world who subscribe to it. But I want to first hear a little bit about you and your journey before you even got to The New Yorker. Maybe we always open up by asking our guests, how did you get where you got? Where, maybe where you grew up, how you were taught, mentored, uh, how you find your career path, and even some bumps along the way before arriving at the August position of general counsel for The New Yorker. Sure. Um, I grew up in New York City um, on the Upper West Side, uh, product of New York City public schools my entire life. Um, uh, my mother was a lifelong New Yorker reader um, as well, and uh, grew up with stacks of them around the house, as as is the tradition. Um, and uh, I, I left home for a brief period. I went to Vassar College for two years, um, but then uh, wasn't really the right time for me um, then. So I took a year off, traveled around a bit, um, and then finished at Hunter College here mm -hmm. in New York City. Um, and uh, I started out really being interested. I was an English major. I was interested in writing and journalism, um, and I had a few uh, journalism internships and freelanced for a couple of uh, New York weeklies um, and got an internship uh, in the newsroom at WNYC Radio, the mm. uh, public radio affiliate here in New York. Um, and then that turned into a job there. I had a couple of different jobs there, um, one in the fundraising department, and then as assistant producer for a talk show that was just starting up called On the Media. Um, it was the, the first iteration of it, not the not the great uh, Brooke Gladstone version that we all know and love today. Mm -hmm. um, it was really when it it was uh, from concept to finding a host, and and so I did that for for almost a year, um, and then decided I wanted to go to graduate school for for journalism. Um, uh, I felt like I just needed to to have that uh, training. Um, and while applying to the graduate school, I saw they had a dual degree with the law school, and I thought that would be interesting. Um, didn't think I would really get into the law school, but I thought, you know, one of the things, one of the reservations I had about journalism was, especially the way journalism was practiced then. I think it's it's changed a bit um, mm -hmm. since then, but we're talking about 1992, uh, 93. Um, was sort of the both siderism, right? Environmentalists say this, and the and mm -hmm. the the lobbyist says that, and and who knows which is right, who has the better argument? But here here they both are, dear reader, and uh, and that always felt unsatisfying to me. Um, I felt like their one side probably is right, and I would like to know which that was, and I naively thought that law school would <laughs> would teach me how to <laughs> how to uh, evaluate. Um, uh, arguments and figure out which was, was the better one. Um, so I applied to the law school um, and uh, to my surprise got in. And um, and that was I, here in New York? That was here in New York at Columbia University. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I did the dual degree and, and I realized I liked law school a lot. And I was, it felt to me as though I was a better lawyer than I had been a journalist in the sense that, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I like reading and writing. I like arguing. I like picking apart 
uh, arguments and ideas, all the things that litigators do. And so when I graduated that program, I decided to, um, you know, that I needed to practice the famous adage is that you don't, you graduate law school without knowing the first thing about how to practice law. Um, and I thought it would be good to learn how to practice law. So um, um, I went to a law firm uh, called Hughes, Herber Hughes Hubbard and Reed. Mm -hmm. uh, very prestigious law firm here in New yeah, York. Yeah, great, great firm. Um, and uh, I joined the litigation department there and got great litigation training. Um, and uh, and then, you know, I sort of had a circuitous path. I, I knew I wanted to go in-house. I ended up switching firms uh, to go to a firm that had a real First Amendment practice. Mm -hmm. um, and then my wife um, had been home with our children at the time. We had a four-year-old and a uh, infant. Um, and she got an offer to make a documentary for HBO. Um, and so we switched places then because we felt like one of us needed to be home with the kids full time, was home with our kids for a year and a half, and cool. then uh, ended up going back to in that in that time, the other firm that I'd gone to squadron on uh, sort of dissolved and, and, and spread to the four winds. Um, and uh, I was asked to go back to Hughes Hubbard. So I spent another uh, three and a half years there and again in in the litigation department and uh um and but really i i did i knew that i wanted to do in-house work and i wanted to do media work that was where my passion was yeah. um and so i got the job at alm media um, which publishes american lawyer magazine and about 30 other magazines and newspapers mostly geared towards lawyers mm -hmm. around the country the new york law journal um I think they do American Banker too, because I used to. Uh, oh, that, that may be. Um, and they have a small publishing division, uh, uh, treatises mostly, um, and a conference division. So I was there for six and a half years as deputy general counsel, um, and really doing it was a it was um, doing the full panoply of things that lawyers deal with. So um, the real estate and and. Uh, leases and HR issues and, um, you know, threats of lawsuits by subscribers who didn't get a subscription or, you know, as well as uh, real, uh, you know, core media First work. First Amendment type uh, stuff, yeah. First Amendment vetting and, and things like that. So, um, and they broke some great stories while I was there too, a corruption scandal in Pennsylvania and, and some other, other pieces that were really significant. Um, and from there, I went to HarperCollins Publishers, as you mentioned, and there I uh, vetted adult uh, trade fiction, uh, trade nonfiction, excuse me. Mm -hmm. So I did the uh, Amanda Knox book um, that she published, um, a, a big book about um, Lance Armstrong that had a mm -hmm. cast of thousands by a great New York Times reporter, Juliet McCurr. Um, uh, book about a Philadelphia uh, police scandal. Um, and I spent two very happy years there reading books and also doing uh, legal affairs for the children's division, which is a lot mm -hmm. of copyright and trademark stuff and author publisher agreements. Um, and the and then the job for the New Yorker came up. And, uh, I applied for it again, thinking there's no way I'll get it. It's the Valhalla of magazine publishing. And uh, um, but I, but I applied and, uh, and to my shock, got the job, um, and I've been here ever since. And that's, um, just almost exactly 10 years ago. A couple of questions going back. What was your wife's documentary that she produced? It was, uh, Unchained Memories, Readings from the Slave Narrative. So this was WPA narratives of the last surviving slaves that the narratives that were done in the thirties and forties. Mm -hmm had been digitized and, and made public. They'd been in the Library of Congress. Um, and so she worked on a documentary that was hiring actors to read the, these narratives that were the, the first person accounts of, of people who had been enslaved. You were sort of on the vanguard, I think, of a couple reversing roles when it was her turn to go out and you came back and took care of the kids. And I wonder, were you sort of on the vanguard or what kind of, was it an easy conversation for you all or? Um, you, know it, you know, the the hallmark of my career is not, real, not realizing things that were apparent to everybody else. I thought it seemed uh, 
perfectly normal, not, you know, but, but I realized at the time when I left uh, the firm, uh, uh, one of the partners said to me, you know, you can pay somebody to do that. You don't, you don't have to do that yourself. And, uh, and I was like, huh, yeah, I know that, but that's not, <laughs> that's not what we want to do. Um, uh, and, and, you know, um, our first, our first child was born when I was in law school and uh, I, I, you know, took her to class with me uh, as an infant. And there was definitely a double standard, you know, people, when I showed up in class with my infant, uh, people oohed and odd and, and offered to share their class notes with me and all kinds of things. And I was where I, I think that female law students who brought their babies to class, uh, were you know got a different reaction like why why are you doing this and you're not serious kind of thing so i i definitely uh feel like there there was a slight double standard and i and i benefited mm -hmm. that you know i was happy to be home with the kids it was harder work in a lot of ways than than uh working at a law firm in the sense that you can't uh can't take a break and go down to starbucks and get coffee and <laughs> you know you can't uh you can't tell the kids, just stay there. I'll be back in 20 minutes. Well, your kids are probably better off for it, I would imagine. That time was, was uh, super valuable to me. Can you talk a little bit more about the specialization in media law? I, you, you mentioned how you, you like to dissect arguments and, and writing in the process, but it's a very specific part of the law. What, what was it? Was it a sense of uh, purpose, justice, focus? What, what is it that holds your imagination? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's... It's a bunch of those things. I mean, I think probably the most important is that I just love journalism, not just journalism. Uh, you know, I I love the arts. I love literature. Mm -hmm. um, and so, look, you know, being a lawyer is just is a ton of work. It's hard no matter what your practice is. You might as well spend it doing something that you're actually interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I certainly... Um, you know, that was really important to me to, to find a practice focusing on something that I cared about as opposed to, you know, say, products liability, which was interesting, um, but not something that I cared deeply about. And then the other part of it is you're able to feel like you're on the right side of things if you're fighting. Yeah. Things, right. I mean, that's that's I'm not going to pretend to be cynical and, and say it it doesn't, you know, matter a lot to me that I'm that I'm doing something that I really believe in as a you know public good um and that I'm and that I'm fighting for things I when I was in law school I got an offer to go work at a firm uh that did a lot of tobacco litigation defense um again this was in 1997 or 96 mm -hmm. And, you know, I thought about it. It was a great firm, uh, terrific reputation, uh, fantastic lawyers, but I just really didn't want to, it's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to fight for tobacco companies. Not that they're not excellent uh, ethical lawyers doing that work, but that just didn't sit well with me. And so, um, you know, uh, again, you spend your life working really hard. You might as well do something that you uh, feel feel good about passionate about it. absolutely so i wonder if you might i, I mean I, I when we met um thanks to our mutual friend cesare at the italian consulate um we talked a little bit about my time at the new york times and david mccraw and other attorneys there i mean Lawyer. the first he's amazing and we worked on many things together and the first amendment work is more important than ever i mean i guess it will always be important but in this polarized world i mean yep. It's really unprecedented. We'll talk about that in a minute. But first, I just wanted to ask if you could shed some light on the balancing of free speech with legal considerations during the editorial process. I mean, you're not going to tell the writers what they can and can't do, but you're going to give them the advice based on the laws you interpret, I would imagine. But can you sort of help us look under the hood? So I, I spend a lot of my time vetting pieces. I read everything in the print magazine before we publish. Um, I listen to our podcast before they go up and our and watch it. We have videos we we do uh, short documentaries and short narrative films mm -hmm. bulk of my day is just is just reading and and watching and listening to stuff out of that i often have questions about a piece about sourcing for a piece about whether we've you know contacted uh people for comment whether someone was actually 
arrested for a crime, whether they were, uh, you know, convicted, whether they were later acquitted, all, mm. all those kinds of questions. Um, and so I spend a lot of time talking to reporters and fact checkers and editors about those issues. And then, you know, during the day, copyright issues will come up, uh, trademark issues come up. As David Remnick likes to say, we are a humor magazine. So uh, oftentimes there are concerns about either shouts pieces or uh or cartoons, whether they are uh, appropriately par can be considered parody for uh, fair use purposes, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really the gamut of media issues uh, that come up. Famously, the client decides. Right? I'm just, I'm just, I can give my best advice, but the client decides. Um, mm -hmm. Although, when when you're in house, you do have a little more one one hopes moral authority. Um, uh, to to you know really advise the client and and when the client grows to trust you, um, they take your advice to heart. Uh, so, you know I think my background as a journalist helps in in understanding what the client is trying to do, what what folks here want to do, and why it's important. Um, and so you know I'm I try really hard not to just say no, you can't do that, but figure out a way that they can do achieve what they want to achieve. Mm -hmm. in a legally defensible and safe way. So that's, you know, that's that's my role is is sort of trying to support and guide um, rather than, you know, vote yes or no on mm -hmm. a series of questions that come to me. Yeah, I would imagine that you're a, a great partner with uh, the editor, David Remnick. Um, uh, can you say a little bit about how you two work together and your relationship or his leadership? Sure. Um, he is he is a fantastic client um, and, uh, you, you know, really sets the tone here at the magazine, um, uh, which is one of decency and focus on on the work and, and not just the output, but how it's done as well, which mm -hmm. is really important um, and makes my job a lot easier because th there's no conflict. The culture is really clear about what our values are and mm -hmm. there's no question about the values. It's a great relationship. I mean, from the outside looking in, the, the commitment to excellence across the publication seems to be uh, undeniable. And I, I can see in your recognition of his work, but also in what we're talking about, how you share that. And like, how can you be against that if you're an employee, a reporter, yeah. a checker, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> about and, you know, I mean, it's, so beautifully. it's, it's not for nothing. I mean, it's, 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 it's great. And it's, uh, ethically and journalistically important, but it's also our brand, right? Is is that excellence and that quality? And if we were to sacrifice quality or excellence or fact checking or um, you know excellent copy editing, even um, uh, that would that would sort of limit the value proposition for our readers, right? They can. Absolutely. You can get bad stuff <laughs> anywhere uh, and, and you can get it for free. Um, yeah. so, so really, I mean, that's that's the whole value proposition is is doing a really good job and everybody gets that. Um, what's what's really special about the New Yorker is that the way we do it is a way that is um, the tone set by David is to is to be really decent about it and just, uh, you know, focus on the work. And uh, I've been in a lot of newsrooms and law firms. I, I think culturally this is changing and newsrooms and law firms don't really tolerate the behavior that they used to tolerate. But, you know, there, there, always, there was always a screamer at, a, at, a, at various law firms that my friends worked at and, you know, bad behavior. And, uh, and that's really just not the case here. That's not, you know, it's not, it feels right. like Certainly before I got here, that was not the case, but it feels like it was never really the case here. That's yeah. just not the kind of place it is, and people yeah. get that. Ladies and gentlemen, again today on The Caring Economy, we're thrilled to have Fabio Bertoni with us. He is the general counsel for the August New Yorker magazine. Fabio, you'd mentioned that um, David Remnick, the editor, talks about the humorous aspects of the magazine. So let's talk about the cartoons for a second. I want to ask sure. you about... Um, your favorite. I I'd mentioned at the uh, opening, my friend Michael Rauschenberg. I mean, those New Yorker cartoons alone are reasons to subscribe if you know you don't want to read too long an article each week. But I wonder, do you do you have a favorite cartoon or 
Am I putting you on the spot there? You're, you're putting me on the spot a little bit. The one that pops to mind is a old Barsati uh, cartoon of a, a rigatoni pasta. Show. <laughs> rigatoni, yes. He's Answering the phone bastard. and he says, Uzili, you crazy bastard. How the hell are you? It still makes me laugh. I will I share that with you. I had a colleague at Christie's, Bendetta Rooks, and that was her favorite one. She had the little picture on her little cubicle. Yeah, I also have this, which is appropriate to lawyers. Uh, it won't show up, but it's a, a Cypress uh, cartoon of a guy waiting in a waiting room and there's a receptionist on the who's answering the phone and she says, and and she's saying, He's dead. Would you like his voicemail? A kid in the Midwest looking at the New Yorker as a kid, you know, you're determined to crack the code and understand what, what you're missing. The humor wise. Mine actually is one of those. It's uh, there's the sophisticated couple st sitting at the bar and she looks at him and she says, it'll never work. You're Nantucket and I'm Vineyard. I mean, it's like so insider baseball, but yeah. such similar yeah. people, but yet so different. I wonder, though, if you might say, Fabio, a little bit about what the cartoons mean to the publication in terms of its its soul or its readership or even its its legal. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the cartoons were there from the beginning. So the magazine was founded in, uh, in 1925 um, and uh, the cartoons were there. And that mix of sort of high low mm -hmm. um, has been kind of the magic sauce of The New Yorker is is humor and in serious writing and serious journalism uh, mixed together. And really the cartoons, you know, they can be mocked as sort of precious. You know, they are sort of beautiful, surprising, perfectly rendered art form, right? In a single panel, you yeah. get you get a setup and a and a joke that is its own universe. And when you think of someone like George Booth, right, who draws those uh, crazy houses, a chaos, and then someone saying, you know, something funny, it's a whole universe in that one panel. And it, mm -hmm. it can also convey something about the human condition, uh, the, the the great ones. Again, it's, it's of a piece with the New Yorker, right? Part of what the New Yorker is, that sensibility, right? There are multiple, there's the surface joke, there's, there's deeper in it deeper parts to it and yeah. everything that we do maybe not everything but the the most successful stuff is multi-layered in that one last question and then a sort of a, a pearl of wisdom question the ai it's everywhere all the time um yep. can you say a little bit about uh both you personally or, or professionally how you're using it or not using it how it's changing your reality at the office um, is there anything that you want to share with the audience about what the New Yorker or Condé Nast, the parent company, is doing or not doing around it? Um, so we are obviously concerned about it. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's a struggle to be more than concerned uh, because I think AI does present. Um, it's here regardless. Um, mm -hmm. and it does. It will present certainly opportunities. Um, um, you know, maybe not necessarily in journalism, but I've been um, told that AI is really helpful in diagnosing certain cancers, say, mm -hmm. uh, in a way that human researchers, it's harder for them to determine and, and the volume that AI can work on. That's a net positive to everybody if AI does that. It also occurs to me that um, there are a lot of news deserts in the country. If AI could summarize, say, town hall meetings or, you know, city board council meetings or water department meetings mm -hmm. and produce reporting based on a transcript and whatever documents that were introduced at those meetings, that's coverage that's not being done right now and might aid people in in finding out what's going on in their their neighborhoods mm -hmm. uh, the the concern obviously is that it replaces the work of human journalists um one so that's and that's that is a real concern because journalism is under threat um it's it's the the market for it is decreasing advertising is down um mm -hmm. and so that's a that's a real concern um and then the other part of it is the the copyright issue, right? So does AI just uh, cannibalize um, human created work yeah. and substitute and substitute for it? And that's, you know, a big part of what 
the magazine and, and Condé Nast is concerned about is just having our content uh, used to train um, large language models that then replace what we sell. Um, mm -hmm. So, so those are the concerns. Um, you know, we are we write regularly about AI and mm -hmm. we, we um, try to cover it as a, a phenomenon that's that's here and is going to um, and raises questions that are you know relevant to all kinds of areas of life. Um, so yeah. um, we are not using AI um, to produce any journalism right now. Um, mm -hmm. And would think long and hard before we did. Um, and I and I think that you know again, as we've been describing, the kind of work that the New Yorker does is not really doesn't lend itself to AI. You know that kind of nuanced, uh, multi-layered, uh, long-term kind of sensitive reporting um, is not, at least yet, uh, what something that AI I think is is useful or or suitable for. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, as a speaking as a lawyer, I think the challenges for lawyers with AI are significant. There are there are AI software programs right now that can review contracts, and uh, and I got an ad for a company now that will draft complaints uh, using AI. And so I don't know how successful those programs are right now, but certainly within the next few years. Um, there, I, I can't imagine that there won't be a real explosion of, of, um, AI based legal services. Mm -hmm. and, and then the other concern is sort of a, um, an inequality concern that I think we all should be thinking about in every aspect of AI. And that's the idea that, um, there will be, my sense is that there'll be a stratification within AI software. And so, you know, some people will be able to afford really good quality AI that's really mm -hmm. smart, that has been trained on sort of bespoke private data sets that are better than other cheaper run-of-the-mill AI. And it, 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 you know, the danger is maybe that it, you know, rather than decreasing inequality, it, it ends up increasing inequality because some people have access to something really incredibly powerful tools that that other people don't have access to. And yeah. and so I think as a society, we need to be mindful of that and make sure that AI doesn't become a, you know, a tool of of that perpetuates further inequality. Right. I'm with you. I, I my my goal in my public speaking and um, some of the teaching I do and even my podcast is to try and encourage people, everyone to in, of a certain age and older to engage with the large language models, just to become conversant in it, to demystify it. Because if we're not doing that, then we can't help shape it. So I share all the points. I share your concern with all those points. I also think though, there is the upside that, you know, just use legal education as an example. There could be so many ways in which AI can help the educators to be more efficient, more effective and training more lawyers potentially to do even bigger and greater things. So watch this space, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there are certainly, right. I mean, you could imagine AI being used in education um, throughout education to really be yeah. meet students' individual needs and be sent, you know, understand their individual needs and be attuned to, you know, the strengths and weakness of an individual student and help them in that way. Um, but there's there's definitely a double edge to that sword if that if it just becomes you know replacement teachers. Uh, my one last question for you, Fabio, is um, pearls of wisdom. What have you gleaned in your career? You've led a very purpose driven life, in my observation, and I wonder um, what you might share with others who either want to be you when they grow up, or who who are um, just starting out, or even those who've been sort of maybe disrupted later in their careers about success and in life and in business. I can't claim. That, that this was entirely intentional, right? There was a certain amount of, of a large amount of luck in my career, mm -hmm. uh, being at the right place at the right time. Um, and, uh, but what, what I will say is, um, I think it is important to think about one's career and try to be intentional about it. Careers don't move in straight lines. It's not a, it's not a ladder that you climb. It's sort of a zigzaggy thing. And, mm -hmm. and, um, 
I think that's important to keep in mind um, that, you know, it's not a matter of just progressing always to the next step. Um, but at the same time, to to uh, do a lot of soul searching and think about what's important to you and what you want your career to mean. But I really care about what I do. Um, so it's it's fulfilling. Um, yeah. So uh, and it's and I think it's much better than than the opposite. Uh um, so, um, you know, but it, it involves sacrifices. It involves working a lot. Um, you know, media law is not exactly the, uh, the, the same as, uh, investment banking in terms of what you earn. Compensation, yeah. Uh, so, you know, um, there, there are certainly, uh, uh, trade-offs that happen, but the, but the goal, at least for me is to, um, do something that I that I care a lot about and and feels meaningful. Yes, well, and we all care about the New Yorker. So thank you for your contribution to that weekly output, ladies and gentlemen. Again, today it's been a thrill to have Fabio Bertoni with us. He's the long term general counsel for the August publication, The New Yorker. And if you don't subscribe, please do. It will make you a better person, a better citizen, a more informed citizen. Um, Fabio, I hope you'll come back in the coming months Absolutely. and tell us more about how things are going. Thanks so much for having me, Toby. This was great.